Good evening, relatives. Again, uh, it is, I think it's Wednesday uh, evening. Hopefully, maybe it's Wednesday where you are. Well, happy Wednesday. Uh, it's a hot and humid afternoon here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm glad to see you all. Um, just to give you kind of a recap of what, ha what happened yesterday, if you missed it. Um, Yesterday, um, during the welcome reception, we shared a, a digital recording of a kitchen table space um, that myself and a group of Indigenous women scholars have gathered around for the past four months. Four months. Um, this uh, has been a, a method of knowledge generation and wisdom sharing with Indigenous kinship at its foundation. We've been led by Dr. Kim Anderson, Associate Professor in the Department of Family, Family Relations and Applied Nutrition at University of Guelph, Ontario, Canada. Um, our group shared stories, sipped tea, and explored what Indigenous feminism is and how our practices of Indigenous feminism make our way into our scholarship and practice. So I'm going to drop the recording into the chat um, if you were not able to see it yesterday or if you'd like to see it again. Um, but today, uh, our group, uh, led by Dr. Anderson, is going to um, share a bit more with you about the methodology and our experience and practice of that methodology. So you will hear today from uh, Dr. Anderson, also from, from uh, Reverend Patricia Bonilla, who is an ordained United Methodist minister with the United Methodist Church in the Northern Illinois Conference and a doctoral student at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. You will also hear from Yeni Delgado, a PhD candidate in psychology of religion at the University of Lausanne. Yeni is a psychologist and public theologian and founder and director of Publica and convener of Women Doing Theology in Abya Yala. And Dr. Lisa Dellinger is a, is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. She's a Louisville Institute postdoctoral fellow, fellow uh, visiting Assistant Professor of Constructive Theologies at Phillips Theological Seminary, and the George Tinker Visiting Professor at Iliff School of Theology. I'm Ann Walker. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and uh, Vice President of the Religious Education Association and a Director of Theological Field Education at Phillips Theological Seminary. So we're grateful that you're here tonight, and I'm going to hand it over now to Kim. Chan, thank you. All right. Okay, we got our screen going here. I'm just going to start the slideshow. Um, and there we go. Everybody can see it okay? Yeah. And I, I just go like this. <laughs> so um, we'll just take a second. Normally, when we start our kitchen table, we go around and we check in with everybody about how they're feeling. But I think I'll just open it up to the group. Just today, we're going to have a couple quiet moments here where we can just, um, you know, think about how, how we're doing at the beginning and, and the end. So we'll just take a second here and uh, everybody can just tune in silently. So just take a minute about how, how are you doing? How are you feeling? So, um, I'm coming to you. It's been a, I'm not going to lie. It's been a pretty hectic, uh, difficult, crazy week for me, but I'm happy to be here. And uh, this is, you know, the culmination of this, uh, this group that we've been working with for four months, as Anne explained. And uh, I want to thank Anne again and again for inviting me to be part of this um, gathering and also for the sisters in the group that you're going to, you met yesterday if you were here or you saw the video and you're going to meet again today um, because it's just made such a rich um, pre-conference experience for us. And I hope that what we share, um, you get something out of it too, that it's rich for, for y'all too. So um, I decided today to dress up in my Grannies of Confederation outfit to channel it all for you. And you're gonna see some of that uh, because uh, one of the things we were talking about as we talked about yesterday was performance and uh, performance art. I got into doing performance art as part of resistance, as a historian, um, wanting to do performance to tell different types of indigenous histories uh, of the America. So this is um, 
performance in a different way, taking back performance and channeling my inner granny of Confederation spirit. And uh, we're gonna talk about indigenous, indigenous feminist spatial practice, which um, is part of that performance. So we're gonna, we're gonna get into that. Plus I just like to dress up. So, you know, it's a good way to start. So we'll go to the next slide. Anne, and forgive me for being like spaced out granny. I don't have my own slides going. So Anne's gonna do it for me. Okay, so um, the first item of business for me and often um, in the institutions in Canada now is of course, acknowledging the lands that we're in and the indigenous people who have held responsibilities for these lands for millennia. And so I'm gonna actually, um, start by doing the, the lands that I'm in. And I, I, I acknowledge that people are all over the place. So welcome. And this is just so exciting. Um, so as I was saying, this has become something of a common practice in Canadian institutions, such as post-secondary institutions. And what you see on the slide here is the one that my university, the University of Guelph uses. And I will start out by saying that land acknowledgements, as they are stated at the beginning of events and ceremonies, and um, some people put them on their syllabi for classes and so on, haven't been without controversy because some people think that it's just lip service. And why are we doing, you know, people are just like a checkbox and they're doing it, but they don't actually think about what that means or there's no change in terms of Indigenous peoples and their positioning in the, um, in these settler nation states, Turtle Island, right? North America. But I, I like them because I think uh, any kind of, uh, I think they've, they've led to certain types of awareness. If nothing else, like when I do them often here, I do like, I talk about the history of the lands and I, I, I help people learn a little bit more about indigenous people in the territory. But I think awareness is really good too, to combat indigenous erasure because the colonial project for us has been to, um, first of all, you know, this whole notion of terra nullius, that there was these empty lands that were here when settlers came. And so therefore it was fine just to go ahead and, you know, take them and occupy them. Um, but also the more you can make indigenous people disappear, the less problematic it is that uh, you're in indigenous, indigenous lands, right? So, um, so yeah. So this, like what you see here is the, like I say, the one that was, is used by the University of Guelph that acknowledges that right now I am, where I'm coming to you from, is in the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, who are people that continue to live on a small landlocked reserve about an hour from where I am in Guelph. And, you know, I'll just note this is an unjust positioning for people who are river people who up until a few hundred years, a few, short few hundred years ago, carried out their lives and responsibilities on some 4 million acres of what's now Southwestern Ontario, where I, where I live. And then if we go further back in the history, we can see that these lands were hunting lands of Haudenosaunee people and further back, homelands of Attawandaran people, uh, also called the neutrals, who were matrilineal folk, which is for me significant um, because when I talk about grandmothers and uh, ancestors and granny spirit, all these things, acknowledging that in these lands we come from um, places where there were matrilineal cultures. So um, also it acknowledges that, it, you know, I like, uh, you know, we got, we're always talking about indigenous erasure and people forget there's urban indigenous people too. There's lots of us, we're still alive. We live here, there's all sorts of stuff going on. So um, there are various nations in the city where I live and I am Métis with roots in Manitoba. So I'm a, I'm a visitor in these territories. Uh, the folks that, um, in, you know, in, in these lands are not the people from, are my people who are from um, further west. So all this to say that I do all of this as um, a prayer for me, a land acknowledgement is a prayer. It's a situating into in space, place, relationality. It's a commitment to ancestors, hence the conference, right? Relations of the past and those ones that are still coming. And we, I saw some of this kind of dialogue in the, in the work that you, uh, a number of you had written about ancestors leading up to the conference. So it was really exciting to see that. Um, and this is me, by the way, doing uh, another piece of performance art down by the river. Guelph is where two rivers meet. And um, we were doing a ceremony around water, but it was also a performance that we were doing for the river. We performed for the river. Um, so the other thing I'm gonna say is if we talk about being good ancestors, uh, it's always good to acknowledge them, which many of you have done, like I said, in your writing. 
And I remember one time I was at this conference in uh, Ireland with my uh, teacher, Maria Campbell. And before I got up to speak, she, she sort of elbows me and she's like, don't forget to thank the ancestors of these lands, right? So wherever you go, it's that, it's that prayer, it's that acknowledgement of whose lands are you in and um, how do you thank them for, for hosting you, for welcoming you. Um, so since this is an online conference and I presume people are from all over the place, I'll just invite you to do any kind of acknowledgement you wanna do in the chat or any kind of silent acknowledgement of the lands that you're in before we begin. So I'll take a sip of water while you're doing that and then Anne can um, flip to the next slide too. And if you don't know the indigenous lands, people of the lands you're in, just put up where you are so we can see where you are and so we can think about all the folks that have come before you and, and will come again. Maybe not all of them, but some of them. Um, oh, somebody tried to put something in. Well, I'll leave that. I'll leave that for the tech folks to figure out. So this is great. We can look and see where people are as we go along. We can review it after. Um, I also find it helpful to ground myself in uh, the dish with one spoon wampum, which also describes the lands that I live and work in. So during the fur trade, um, the English and the French up here were at war and, and in competition, ind indigenous nations got caught on either side, right? So the Anishinaabek and the, and the Haudenosaunee were in battle with each other as a result, but they came together in 1701 and they made this um, treaty of great peace drawing from an older Haudenosaunee concept that comes from, the, um, from their great law, their great law of peace, which is much older, of course. And I love this quote, it comes from Rick Hill, who's a Tuscarora uh, person, who teacher, very knowledgeable scholar. And again, the reserve that he's on is Six Nations of the Grand River, about an hour from where I live here. And the idea is you share, um, you take care of resources and you don't take more than you need. So I, often talk about this when I start with groups and I say, well, what does this mean now? Like this was comes from 1701 and actually even further back, you know, into the 1100s of the great law. But what does this mean? And I use it actually for classes. So if I'm, you know, I, I was teaching classes around sexuality and people are like, well, this really helps us to think about consent. And I was like, okay, that's good. You know, you can think about you're working in the dish with one spoon. What does that mean in terms of your practice? Um, as a sex edu educator talking about consent, but also what does it mean about the peoples in these territories that you're still uh, working with? So I also think about, you know, like I say, it's kind of like, as I say, not gonna lie, it's kind of hard, there's hard stuff going on for me personally and, and just all the um, crisis, climate crisis, the, the shootings, the political instability, war, you know, all these atrocities are weighing heavy on us. So how do we think about what this means and how we go forward. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. So acknowledging ancestral relations and, and doing land acknowledgements doesn't mean just human relations, it means all our relations. So um, I like to acknowledge the waters and acknowledge that I'm situated in a place that is so blessed by water, right? There I am on the little red dot, that's me right now where the, my server is coming from. Um, and waters are also connected to spiritual uh, practices and responsibilities of women in a lot of the indigenous nations that I work with. So here I am in the province of Ontario, handsome lake or great lake, sparkling water in a number of different Iroquois languages. And um, I give thanks for being in the middle of all of these freshwater lakes. I'm so grateful. Okay, and then we're gonna go on to another relation, which is the moons. Um, so another relation that I like to, that, that I've worked with a lot and that I talk a lot about when, in my work with women uh, is the moon, grandmother moon, because there's this uh, lots of, um, and again, in, the, in a number of different cultures, these relationships between women and the moon. The obvious one is because the moon regulates the cycles and seasons of everything on earth, right? And we have our moons, our moon times, which is also a part of regulating uh, how life uh, comes to earth and uh, our capacity to give life to the future as women. So um, it's, an, it's, an, it's a practice that I've been doing moon, full moon ceremonies for probably uh, 30 years, I guess. 
And it's, you know, it's a practice. Once you get into the rhythm of it and the cycles and seasons, you, you, you start to learn about the cycles and seasons of yourself too, and of the women that you work with in these ceremonies. And I just want to acknowledge right now we're in between two full moons and, this, and, and the ceremonies that go with them. And in Anishinaabe Mawin, in Ojibwe, um, the strawberry moon, which we've passed now, and of course there's lots of strawberries out there, is the Odemangizis, which has to do with reconciliation. And I want to read this quote from uh, Muskrat Magazine because they, they published what the moons mean. And I just think it's beautiful. And it also thinks about us situating ourselves in this place and time. So um, the sixth moon of the creation is strawberry moon. The medicine of the strawberry is reconciliation. It was during this moon that communities usually held their annual feasts, welcoming everyone home, regardless of their differences over the past year, letting go of judgment and or self-righteousness. The strawberry is the first berry to ripen, and it is thought to be a good medicine for the heart and the teeth, and also used as, um, as a medicine in, in women's ceremonies and uh, like puberty ceremonies and things like that, right? So we just come through the strawberry moon and we're on our way to Mishkomen and Gizus, the raspberry moon, which is uh, the seventh moon of creation and when great changes begin. By learning gentleness and kindness, we may pass through the thorns of its brush and harvest its fruit as we gain knowledge that will help in raising our families. So um, we are at a time between reconcilia reconciliation and change. And um, I invite you to ponder on how, how we, what, what part we play in that, right? Okay, now we're gonna move on to settler time. Um, so in another calendar of space and time, um, I actually wrote this presentation on July 1st, which happens to be Canada Day and a couple of days, of course, before July 4th. So for those that are in North America, of course, we've just come through these um, um, settler national celebrations, I'll say, national celebrations. And um, this also made me think about what, where we're sitting at in between these moons of reconciliation and change. And I was thinking of the ancestors of the settler nation states where we find ourselves now. I'm talking about the ones in Turtle Island, but they're of course all around the world. And um, this is this for, for where I am, this is the iconic painting of Canada's Fathers of Confederation. Um, and I've often talked about like who was sitting at those tables and why. Maybe it's not much to ponder, but uh, how has this affected how we evolve in these lands and territories we now call Canada? And where, um, you can hit the next, the next part of it, and where are we now? And what does this mean for the futures that we're building, right? For the ancestors that are coming? What does all of this mean? So um, if you go to the next one, and we, we, need to, we need to engage in critical thinking as educators. All of us, from what I understand here, are educators. And of course, what we do is we encourage critical thinking. Um, and for me, that means grounding myself uh, and with myself and the people I work with, with the ancestral relations and traditions that I come from. And we've had to, as Indigenous people, work hard to reclaim a lot of those because those are the things that were beaten out of us in residential schools or banned or outlawed or shame and all these things, right? So we've had to work hard to reclaim those. And I think that's really, um, been so significant in terms of the healing journey for Indigenous peoples and myself for sure. And how do you bring those things into the places where you find yourself, which in my case is an urban, small urban city, right, in Ontario, um, and how those things can serve the times that we're in. So that brings us to kitchen table methodologies, which is the next slide of um, how we can do this through kitchen table methodologies, right? What kind of critical thinking you bring. And um, I think I, I really like this um, slide by Mishana Goldman, who talks about native feminism. Here, here's the part where we bring in the indigenous feminism. She talks about native feminism spatial practice as being narrative relations constructed not only as a critique of colonial orderings, but also one embedded in native epistemologies and narrations that envision the future. So a lot of the work I do is around storytelling, um, restorying, and storing the, storing the future based on what we know from the past, right? Uh, and that includes performance and, and kitchen table methodologies. So let's go to the next um, quote that I'm gonna read in full because it's just been so inspiring to me to learn from 
uh, Sherry Ferrell Rosette, who's a Métis scholar and magnificent artist. And this is a quote that she said at a kitchen table event that she was hosting at a storytelling conference in 2017 in Saskatchewan. And she has, you know, she's a, she's a bead, she's an artist, but also a bead, a bead worker. And um, so she does kitchen table, um, like conference stuff where people have beadwork on the tables and they're doing food and engaging in dialogue. So a lot of what I've done has been built off her vision. And what she says is, it's important to look at the kitchen beyond the female and the domestic. Indigenous kitchens are a synthesis of influences originating in a small circle of people sitting on the ground around a central fire, moving into small log homes where the kitchen table was literally the only flat working space. Eating was the least of the activities done around our kitchen table. It was primarily a creative space, a work surface, a space for meditation and a social space. It was a space of action. Circularity and expansion, almost limitless, is implied in kitchen logic. Even the word tawal, most often simply translated as welcome, can be understood as there is room for you here, and also implies space on the ground. It wasn't a marginalized female space where women served men. It was a female-centered space where men, women, and children worked, dreamt, and created. Okay, so... Um, so this is where my confederation uh, outfit comes in. Wait a second, I'm like a little bit lost here. Did you, can you just go ahead one? And I think I've got, yeah. Okay, sorry folks, I'm, I have missed something, but maybe I need to jump ahead anyways, yes. <laughs> Okay, I will talk uh, later about the grannies and confederation if you want. But so for me, how do you bring in kitchen table practice? It comes from um, learning outside the academy and learning from uh, people like Maria Campbell, who's a Métis um, playwright, author, elder scholar. And she's really taught us about um, this notion of win, which is the visiting way, what uh, another Métis scholar, Cindy Godet, has called the, the visiting way. So... Um, in addition to being this multidisciplinary successful storyteller, she's taught us that kitchen tables are places for community organizing, storytelling, artivism, growing gardens in rough places. Um, and she's learned this by, um, you know, taking on a whole bunch of us and training us through her and at her kitchen table. So I'm going to read from um, a little passage from a, an introduction that I did for her, um, the revised edition of her biography, Half Grade, and it describes what the kitchen table I've been trained at looks like. It's midsummer 2017, and a group of women are sitting around the open kitchen area at the crossing, Maria Campbell's home on the South Saskatchewan River. For many of us, this is Métis homeland, a space Maria created on the land where Gabriel Dumont and his wife Madeline once operated Gabriel's Crossing. In Dumont's time, a ferry transported Red River carts across the South Saskatchewan as they made their way to Batoche and other nearby Métis communities. Maria's great-grandmother Cheechum spent time here when she was a child, and later, when Maria was a girl, it was a stopping place where her family would camp, visit with the owners overnight, or spend a few days by the river while Maria's dad and uncles threw fishing nets. Maria purchased the property in 1975, a few years after Halfbreed was published, and since that time, it has been a place where Indigenous leaders, storytellers, musicians, artists, activists, and scholars have crisscrossed, coming and going to replenish and engage as they make their marks on the world. You can still see the tracks of the Red River carts on the hills as they snake down toward the river, familiar signs for those of us who have spent days sitting on the bank on the other side. For this is where Maria sends people out to fast. And today we feel the power of those timeless tracks as we have just completed our week-long fasting camp. We are exhilarated and exhausted from all the labor involved in holding ceremony, and we are ready to settle into the storytelling that follows. Maria is finally sitting down at the kitchen table next to the big brown teapot that never goes empty. Mugs are scattered about, but the rest of the dishes are drying in a basin on top of the wood stove. Pots have been hung back up into their proper places on the walls, and the fasters and helpers sit at the tables or sprawl out on the couches under the fine art in the adjoining living room. Most of us are middle-aged Métis and First Nations women, and in our lives outside the crossing, we work in community organizing, academia, law, medicine, midwifery, land-based learning, and the arts. We are part of Maria's extensive lodge family, 
the ones who work, train, and do ceremony with her. She has mentored every one of us, and as she nears her 80th year, she is telling us that she wishes to transfer some of the responsibilities she's been carrying. We look around and realize that even though there are eight of us present and as many or more across the country, we will be challenged to take it up because of the current range and depth of her work. So um, you can go to the next slide. And so I, I, that, that's like where I've been trained outside the academy. Okay, you can just flip through these ones. We'll, we'll come back to that if people are interested. <laughs> I don't know how they got switched around, sorry. Keep going. Um, okay, so um, I've tried to figure out how to be an academic ante in the academy and um, to build a house for the table I can now draw on, building on that vision of what Maria has. So at my lab meetings with my students, we do work together, we um, eat together always, we cook together, we talk as in, as in what you saw us doing in the presentation yesterday, um, where we foster an environment of responsibility and kinship to each other. And the way in which you do that is by, you know, you just, you bring your humanity to the table. You, you talk about how things are going with you first. Um, and when I think about all of this, um, I think Maria was talking about how when she had a dream and a vision to build this place at, at Gabriel's Crossing in Saskatchewan, and she was dreaming that she was trying to hold on to something so hard. And her uncle said, came in the dream and said, why are you working so hard? All you have to do is make tea, right? And I think that's like, it really does work um, if you let go and you, and you host people and, and you create a, that kind of space where all of those things that Sherry Farrell Reset was talking about uh, can happen. So um, I, I came back from that fast actually, and I decided I wanted to try, I said to Maria, do you think we could replicate what we do here in an, an academic institution? And she's like, yeah, I think so. So, um, I joined up with two other indigenous women and I like this word Ganongwe, which means three or more women, right? So I joined up with these two uh, women, Sherry, for, uh, Sherry Longboat and Brittany Luby in my university. And um, we decided we were gonna build a land-based lab in the University Arboretum. We just decided we were gonna do that and uh, create a space where people can um, re-engage in indigenous relationality with all our, with all our relations, plants, animals, humans, uh, ancestral through ceremony. So there's ceremonial grounds there and so on. And um, I really love this quote that I heard from another Métis elder one time, which was Rose Fleury. Um, and she said, you know, women need to gather again because when women gather, that's how we evolve as a people. And uh, she was talking about ceremonies, but she was also talking about the kind of thing that actually our group has been doing uh, these last four months. So um, you saw a little example of what we were doing, the talking circles that I do, and how it allows this kind of space for a grounded knowledge and creativity. So now I'm going to finish my part and um, turn it over to the sisters that were part of the group to, in some cases, read, in some cases, talk um, on their reflections, what they've, what they've brought, what they bring to the table, what they've brought from, from all of this. And we'll take a minute, just a, a kind of like quiet time after they're each one is finished and move to the next. So Lisa is going to start. Lisa, you're muted. Thank you. I was so involved in listening to Kim, I got distracted. Um, thank you, Kim, and thank you, Anne. Um, when we decided how we were gonna do this, um, Anne asked me to just say something about um, indigenous cosmologies. And I could lecture on that for days, <laughs> but I'm not gonna do that to you or to myself. And instead I sat down and decided to do um, a stream of consciousness reflection. So anytime you hear a collective pronoun in this, I want you to remember that I'm not just talking about our human relatives. I'm talking about the land, the water, 
all being sentient and non-sentient. Um, and within this cosmology, there is no Aristotelian great chain of being where the human being is just below God and the angels. Um, that is not a part of this particular reflection. So that's the only guidance I'm going to give you. <clears throat> Remembering, knowing, and imagining who and whose we are not just who I am, made of salt, water, blood, breath, and the balance of the universe held in deep abiding mystery. We are at once mundane and sublime, living in the Malachite and the humble nest, the eggs nestled within, as well as the stars that flare above the firmament. We are literal flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. Your bruises are our bruises. Your laughter fills our lungs. The fire of our spirits warms the worlds, both seen and unseen. The dreams of those who came before and those who are yet to be move, coalesce, remember, imagine and connect. Despite the compromises and the pain, the promise continues of living, truly living again and again and again and again. Kim, you're muted. I see you talking now. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, let's just take a second to think on that and breathe. And then when you're ready, Patricia, you can go next. Thank you, Kim. So I really appreciate um, the land acknowledgements. And um, <clears throat> I want to acknowledge the um, indigenous communities from the region that my parents are from, um, the Huichol, the Tepehuano del Sur, the Nahual and the Masawe indigenous communities from Zacatecas, Mexico. And the image that you see um, on the screen is a cactus with prickly pears um, at the top. Uh, in Spanish, we call it nopal and uh, tunas. <clears throat> and I wrote a piece in the, um, for the REA um, that I hope you all will have a chance to read along with um, the many other wonderful um, articles and reflections that are written by my colleagues in the journal um, leading up to this conference. Um, I wanna thank um, Anne for the invitation to be a part of this Indigenous Women's Kitchen Table space and to Kim for facilitating this methodology um, <clears throat> of kitchen table, and also um, to my colleagues, um, Yeni and Lisa, who have been a part of this, this collaborative work and the space that has been very nourishing to my soul and um, very empowering. Um, I also wanna thank Patrick for um, his encouragement to write um, for, um, for the REA journal and to, to think about embodied and ancestral knowledge. Um, this collaboration and kitchen table practice has really helped me focus on particular guiding standpoints for my scholarship and the communities that inform the work that I do. So I have a, a short quote that I want to share with you all 
Um, this is written by uh, Var this is written by Vargas Valente, last name Vargas Valente. Um, she's quoted in Maria Pilar Aquino and Maria Jose Rosado Nunez's book, Feminist Intercultural Theology, Latina Explorations for a Just World. And she posits that critical theories always have practices behind them. Or in other words, concrete practices have a concrete theory that emerges. She cites the work of Boaventura de Sosa Santos, who reminds us that, quote, recovering practices means recovering theoretical frameworks, opening channels through which social transformation can flow, end quote. This epistemological shift, she argues, emanates from concrete experiences and nourishes new paradigms. And that quote really um, kind of centers some of the things that I wanna share um, for this presentation. Um, as I started researching the histories and theories of religious education um, as part of my dissertation, it became clear to me that Latine, Latinx women are absent or glossed over um, for not fitting into the traditional mold of what is considered Christian religious education. And this absence um, raises important questions for my scholarship and embodied practices. Some of the questions that emerged um, during this research is, how have Latin A women been erased from the ancestral genealogy of Christian religious education? What does this say about what we value in this guild and in our institutional practices? How do we understand knowledge? How do we produce and reproduce this knowledge? And in ways, um, how do we reproduce this knowledge that in many ways generates violence? What can we do to reclaim and retell their stories? And how can we reframe our work to give voice to the communities that inform and support us? And so as I started thinking about um, writing this piece, I had a conversation, I was over with my mom and was having a conversation with her as we prepared a meal together and we were making nopales sauteed with onions and tomatoes and with a bit of epazote. And my uncle had just returned from Mexico and had brought, <laughs> and he had brought um, uh, an unpasteurized cheese that is made using like a very unique aging process from um, the hometown where my parents are from. And then it's dipped into this chili sauce. So it's this aged cheese that's covered in like a red chili sauce and you eat that with nopales and it's just delicious. Um, as we ate, my mother mentioned a story that she had recently heard on the news about alternative sustainable practices using nopales in Mexico. And we continued our conversation about sustainability and global, the global market. We talked about migration. We talked about farming practices. Um, we talked about the many, many risks that people undertake in order to make the trip to the US. We talked about planting her garden and about the concern of rising prices of all the basic necessities that we have. We talked about lots and lots of things, which is how it always is when we get together to share a meal. As we talked, my article that I, that I was writing, it really became uh, it came together uh, in this conversation. And so I asked my mother um, some, some questions as I was thinking like, how am I gonna piece this together? And I asked questions about my grandmother. I asked questions about my great-grandmother. I asked questions about the Mexican revolution. And I talked about, um, you know, how this might all connect with the church and, um, 
she shared with me about the story of the, the Cristeros War in Mexico and how um, the, the church's role um, in that war um, was an important because the church tried to maintain the status quo of the elite classes um, even after the, the Mexican Revolution. So we talked about so many things. Um, and so for this presentation, I didn't want to read the paper because um, it, it's, it's already in print and I, I hope that you, you have a chance to, to, um, to read it. Um, but what I wanted to do is talk to you all about the writing process. Um, and I wanted to honor the voice of my mother and through her also honor the voice of many women. I wanna recognize the communities who do not have voice often in the genealogies of Christian religious education. And yet they are the ones who inform our scholarship, mine especially, um, they hold us accountable they probe and they question and they inspire. And so communities do matter. We do not do our work in isolation. We're all connected to multiple communities. The practices, theologies and epistemologies we embody impact far beyond our imagined possibilities, far beyond what is visible and what is tangible. That is why it's important to keep, for me, living into these relationalities, into mutuality, community building, interculturality, which is something that has come up in this conference over and over again, because we're all ancestors to each other. And so as religious educators, we're accountable to our multiple communities. And I pray that in the practicing of interculturality, we can shift our epistemologies and our pedagogies, and that these um, epistemological shifts then also inform and continue to shape our intercultural practices. This is where the, the theory informs the practice and the practice informs the theory. And so I wanna share um, something that I've been sitting with the last few days. This is a a reading um, uh, from ha the uh, a biblical reading from ha the book of Habakkuk. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's um, chapter one, verses one through four. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. And so I thank you all for um, being in the space and for listening to my reflection. Um, in, I think that as academics, we have this tendency to connect everything and to lay out our arguments in a very particular way. And um, a wise auntie, um, I, I learned this word from Kim. Thank you, Kim. I really uh, like, like this term, auntie. A wise auntie once offered her wisdom to me when I raised a concern about my work. I was worried that my writing or my scholarship might not connect everywhere. Maybe people would not follow all the threads that I had laid out. And she responded to me, you don't always have to make all the connections. Let people make the connections they need to make for themselves. And so that for me was a very important pedagogical lesson. And it is what I would like to offer um, you all this evening. Thank you. Thanks so much, Patricia. So we'll just take a second to just let all that sink in. And then when you're ready, Anne, you can go next. In the 1830s, my paternal grandmother's family came to Indian territory as part of the historic Trail of Tears. 
The Trail of Tears was the forced removal of Cherokees from our homelands along the U.S. Eastern woodlands due to a series of Supreme Court decisions and treaties designed to limit uh, native tribal sovereignty and to claim sought after tribal land to expand white settler wealth. Along with the Cherokees, members of the Creek, Choctaw, Seminole, and Chickasaw tribes, collectively known in the US as the five civilized tribes, were driven from their ancestral homelands, gathered into stockades, and forced to walk some 1,200 miles to Indian Territory in what is now the state of Oklahoma. It is estimated that tens of thousands of indigenous people died of dysentery, typhoid, cholera, and starvation on the journey. Many families eventually resettled in Indian Territory where they reestablished their tribal governments and made new homes. Then at the turn of the 20th century, the United States again saw opportunity at the expense of Indian people. President Grover Cleveland's administration in a bid to again open Western lands to white settlers implemented the Dawes Act, which included a system of registration on a set of federally recognized roles by each land owning family in Indian, in Indian territory. And those families would have to improve indigenous ancestry in order to reestablish their tribal affiliation and to be eligible for this land. Once proven, the Indians on the Dolls Rolls would not be permitted to remain on the plot of land where they had begun life in Indian territory, but rather would receive an allotment of 160 acres of land from the US government upon which to live and work. And all of this land would, would become part of the nation um, of their tribe. Um, this land would not often appear in consecutive acres and um, was often unsuitable for farming, thus creating economic insecurity for the tribes. Previously held Indian land was made available to white settlers who in 1889 would run to Oklahoma to claim land and establish for them a brand new state. In addition to re-allotting land, the Dawes Roll served as the US government's measuring stick to determine who was Indian and who was not. Even today, tribes like my own continue to utilize the Dawes Rolls to determine tribal citizenship by ancestry, marked on one's tribal citizenship card by blood quantum. This problematic practice of tribal governments utilizing colonial tools by which to manage tribal affiliation and wealth has had dastardly effects including the exclusion of many African-American freed people from uh, inclusion in, uh, in the tribes, which would serve as a significant point of repair for the holding of black slaves by Indian people. My grandmother's father, Tashi Jackson, and his wife, Pet Evelyn England, both appear on the Dawes Rolls and were provided an allotment in 1902 in Delaware County, Oklahoma. I am the descendant of a series of stubborn, bookish, tongue-in-cheek Cherokees who have for generations worked to preserve the real histories of Native people in Oklahoma, despite the state's insistence on celebrating land runs in public schools. And these are annual events where third graders on land run day, which is a sunny day each May, run their school playgrounds in simulated covered wagons wearing cowboy hats and prairie bonnets, while they pretend to stake their claim in this quote, land of opportunity. At the same time, I am the descendant of the Walkers, a group of wealthy white settlers who came to, to Texas and Oklahoma in pursuit of surplus land. I'm also a religious educator from a lineage of process and liberation theologians who is constantly working to make sense of the clash of warring epistemologies within myself. I never knew Pet England, and my life with my paternal grandmother, Trula, only lasted three years. My father, Trula's son, became debilitated early in my adult life, so I never really had the opportunity to talk to him about it, what it meant to be the descendant of both white Oklahoma farmers and Cherokee suffragists, about how to pursue freedom when who you are includes the lineages of both colonizer and colonized residing in your bloodstream. I recently attended a workshop sponsored by the Collegeville Institute where the REA's incoming president, Patrick Reyes, was our guest speaker. The topic was drawing from our ancestral wells to write about call and vocation. I remember Patrick describing the ways he has been called to life as one, quote, called to life, those are Patrick's words, 
as one who sits at the intersection of generations of Carmelitas. He told the story of sitting, he's told stories of sitting at his grandma Carmelita's kitchen table while she, while she encouraged his curiosity and dreams. He encouraged us to find the points of creativity and resistance in our own lineages, even when our ancestors were not known to us. Sometimes Patrick said, all we have is our imaginations. We can connect with our ancestors by learning who they were. We can imagine the journeys our ancestors have undertaken and the resources they developed along the way in order to survive. And we can find those resources residing in our own bloodstreams and daily practices of meaning making. I've become a religious educator who wants to resist the practices of white domination in my own lineage by identifying sites of, religious of indigenous creativity and resistance so that I can enact pedagogical practices that honor the wisdom of my Cherokee ancestors and provide recognition of the kin that all, all of my students bring with them into the theological classroom. Enter Kim Anderson, whose paper on indigenous feminist kitchen table methodologies I encountered while shuffling through articles on my couch one lazy Sunday afternoon. As soon as I read Kim's article, the image of Patrick sitting at his grandma Carmelita's table came to mind. Then I remembered sitting at my grandma Trula's dinner table in the 70s, eyeing a jar of peanut butter cookies on top of the refrigerator, patiently waiting for my parents and grandparents to stop talking about tribal politics and corrupt state politicians while I cleaned my plate so that I could climb up on a step stool and slip my hand into the cookie jar. After I read Kim's article, I became passionate about indigenous food ways and about creating a recipe book of my mother-in-law's tried and true recipes that be could be distributed to her grandchildren at Christmas time. My mother-in-law, Roberta, is a Cherokee woman from Adair County, Oklahoma, who at 11 was dropped off at an Indian boarding school with her younger sister. While the school indeed enacted practices of forced assimilation upon my mother-in-law and other native children, she also learned to cook there and how to survive. As an adult, Roberta then stood alongside her mother-in-law, Lily Gibson in Choctaw, Mississippi, to learn the dishes that she now serves to us. I want my son and his cousin to utilize these recipes as a source of ancestral wisdom, as a way to be literally fed by the spirit of creativity and resistance that has sustained our family's continued survival. So I called Roberta to get together and write down these pieces. And I visited her home numerous times to work on this. And every time I would visit her, um, my husband and son would come along and I would come in like ready to get going. And she would say, I'm not ready. And instead she would sit my husband and son and I down to a meal of pork chops and meatloaf, squash and scallop potatoes, pecan pie and chocolate cake. And while we ate, she would tell me um, her secret recipes and her cooking methods. And she would tell me about Lily Gibson and how Lily cooked. <clears throat> and she would also take me into the kitchen where we would make ch chicken and dumplings together, the flat kind, not the round drop kind of dumplings. And eventually the conversation around the kitchen table would return to tribal politics and corrupt state politicians. In those moments, Roberta was teaching me, my son and her son through doing. And not only that, we were ingesting the very practices of creativity and resistance that have allowed our family to persevere amidst repeated attempt, attempts at our extermination. What Patrick's grandmother Carmelita, my grandmother Trula, and my mother-in-law Roberta enacted in their homes around the kitchen table is kitchen table methodology where we practiced in my new Auntie Kim Anderson's words, quote, ceremony, we cooked and ate, nurtured one another, planned and organized toward social and environmental justice, end quote. Practices of ancestral wisdom, transmission, political resistance, and traditioning around a kitchen table are not exclusive to indigenous women and need not necessarily be associate, associated exclusively with cisgender women with mothering or, with, or even with, reside, with residing in the home. Rather, the possibility of the creation of these spaces and of kitchen table methodology as a discursive space owned by the entire community means that we can make meaning, identify strategies for change, teach while doing, and cultivate kinship while bringing our ancestors' traditions to continued life. 
These practices are identity shaping practices where meaning structures come to life. And where a, um, to use Willie James Jennings terms, a pedagogy of belonging is enacted. What would it mean to enact such methodologies and pedagogies into the decision making and knowledge sharing structures of our guild? What would it mean to provide recognition to the pantheon of ancestors that our students bring with them into the theological classroom? I see this not as indigenous appropriation, but as the adaptation of traditions that exist across cultures and generations. This is teaching by doing. These are spaces where we can be honest about our community's dastardly practices, where we can confess our shortcomings and where we can share our vulnerabilities, questions and dreams in spaces of kinship and accountability. These are spaces where perhaps we can bring to life the wisdom and stories of religious educators who have gathered, gathered around the edges of our annual meetings for five generations past, whose stories were never heard and whose work was scarcely published. These are spaces where future generations of Carmelitas, Jacksons, Englands, Walkers, Hans, Hearns, Kims and Lees, Delgados and Bonillas, Lockharts and Farmers, Wrights, Moors and Hesses, can develop new knowledge and make new meaning in a community of colleagues connect, connected to the wisdom of generations. And so I lift my mug and sip my tea in gratitude to Pet and Trula, to Roberta and Carmelita and to Auntie Kim, and to the women who have gathered around this digital kitchen table for the past four months with an invitation for all of us to determine where spaces of belonging might be created for this generation and those to come. Thank you, Anne. So we'll just sit with that for a minute and then, um, Anne, I believe you can put on the recording of Yenny's, right? Is Yenny here? Yes, I'm here. But we're gonna listen to your recording as we sit. My grandmother's prayers, the pedagogy of ancestral memory in faith and resistance. Growing up, I was fascinated with my grandmother's long hair. Her hair was not only an extension of herself, but a physical manifestation of her thoughts and a strong connection of care and resistance. I had memories of my grandmother braining her hair early in the morning and every night before she went to bed. She braided her hair while she was praying and other times singing. If someone asked why she had long hair, she always answered. Women are beautiful with a long hair and we need to take care of ourselves. Or hair grows every day. Her long braid transmit me to a, a womanist and a strong woman, while at the same time showing the ancestral roots to a traditional way of living for native women in Abjajala or ancestral land. My mother, Candelaria, my grandmother, Candelaria, was born between mountains, the Andes, a generation of native people in the land of millennials. She born in February, the month of rain, and grew up with vegetables and potatoes and corn. Her face was beautiful. Her long hair always caused me magic and seen them with beauty. She never colored or dyed her hair, and she was proud of her gray hair, grown by age and wisdom. She was a weaver and a farmer. For that reason, her hands was rough and crabbed and deep. 
she wore with her hands, who was connected to the land, or ancestral motherland took care of her. My grandmother raised seven children and she raised them in community. She began also challenge and effort to raise all the children. As a part of the native population with no access to education, she find a church or was a place she was welcomed and encouraged to learn. At the age of 30, she took the courage to learn how to read. From there, she read her Bible every day loud for everyone to want to hear. She has a deep faith in God who brought us freedom and renovate our spirit. But who taught my grandmother to braid her hair? When did it begin? My grandmother learned from her mother and grandmothers, recognizing the history of their life and care from one generation to the next. This is perhaps the school of life, which is a full of memories and affection in learning from one generation to the next. But seeing firsthand is a way to learn by example. But not all the days were like that. Not always native women were allowed to have a long hair. Interesting to learn more about the history of her hair and I mean of braids. I started looking for more information. I went back to history to learn what happened for native women and men here to re during colonization. The tragedy event for century broken the relationship of people in Abtajala. In our native land, my ancestors suffered genocide, slavery, and rape of our bodies and hair. Colonization was a rupture between mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, wife and um, husbands. The hair of men and women was cut as a sign of enslavement, powerless, and humiliation. To look more like the colonizer, look like a human being, be a civilized people. Even though the, we lost our land and we forced to culture assimilation for the Spanish, the Portuguese, the English, the French, resisting while away or living. For this reason, in native communities is still present today, women have power when they are allowed to take care of themselves and practice our own ancestral traditions. Having a long hair and braids every day has become resistant against colonization in the last centuries. That how was my grandmother comb her hair every day. It was a form of identity, ancestral memory, protection, and resistance. Between my grandmother and me is a century of history. How can I continue my grandmother's ancestral memory? In the last year, my hair has grown and I come and braid it twice a day. Her presence dry close to me every time that I braid my hair. I remember my grandmother with joy every day, as we can read in the Bible. Your testimonies are the heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. In the last time, I talked with my grandmother was a week before her physical pass. At the age of 91, she received several passages for the Bible and sang their beautiful song. I listened with happiness 
in the distance. Because Kobe, I cannot visit my grandma anymore. But I learned from my grandmother my family history and prepares me to understand my own life. Faith and courage to speak up and write about the colonization and ancestral memory. I remember my grandmother Candelaria as a Yachachi Warmi, wisdom, women, mujer sabia, womanist, and a healing woman. Her faith accompanies me and encourages me to recognize her as a teacher to keep our ancestral memory alive. So we have these beautiful stories and reflections and ideas and kitchen table conversations to reflect on. And um, now we're just gonna open it up and see if folks have comments or questions that they want to um, put out there on the table. Kim, you might also go back at some point and talk about um, uh, the work you did around um, the granny grannies of the Confederacy. <laughs> yeah, well. I don't know how we lost that. I can do that if you want while people are thinking about their questions. I won't do the whole thing, but I can tell you what it was if you're curious. <laughs> I'll at least show the picture that you shared. Okay, you can show the different pictures and um, I'll explain what it was. <clears throat> I'm getting there. If you can. So um, I was, oh, go back. Apologies. So this has to do with creating space and resistance. And um, I was thinking about this between um, reconciliation and healing and all these types of ideas and it being between Canada Day and um, July 4th. And so this is, comes from performance that we did and that's where my Grannies of Confederation comes from. We were asked to, I was asked to um, be part of this celebration of Canada sesquicentennial, 150 years. And um, I thought, well, instead of just doing a panel or something, and well, first of all, I said to my Dean, why are you asking me to be part of a Canada 150 celebration? Because indigenous people are a little bit, a little bit bitter about that, <laughs> about that right? Like, so why are you asking me? You know, I'm gonna be a shit disturber. And he said, that's why I'm asking you. So I said, okay, all right. So we, we could do a panel on colonization and this and that, but instead let's, um, let's do something embodied. And so women, as we say, when women gather, that's how we evolve and we come up with all sorts of crazy things, ideas and stuff. So I got together with a bunch of uh, indigenous women who work in the, um, in the universities nearby and we decided we were gonna do performance art around the grannies and confederations. So we told everybody, okay, go and find out how your grandmothers might have dressed if they were invited to the ball at confederation, might have dressed if they've been at the table and just research your own nation, your own grandmothers and then dress up. So what we did was we dressed up and then we sat at the conference tables stoically and we didn't talk. So people came in and they had to figure out what they were gonna do with us because we were actually sitting on their tables and stuff like um, frozen. And, you know, there's all this um, learning that happened around discomfort and negotiation and figuring out space and place and so on. And then um, um, towards the end, you can put the next one too. We had a really great photographer named Tanil Campbell, who's a Dene photographer. And she posed us as the, as the grannies of Confederation, of course, if you flip the next slide, it shows yeah, so there's the Fathers of Confederation. Oh, they disappeared. Um, 
there they are. The fathers, so she posed us as the Granny's Confederation and we sent it out as our digital Christmas card that year because we said Indigenous people are kind of tired of all this, you know, national stuff that uh, doesn't speak about what it meant to us, you know, in developing this nation state and what would have happened if the women had been there. So that's our Christmas card that we sent out the Grannies of Confederation wishing you merriment as Canada 150 comes to an end. Um, so that's that's me and my granny outfit um, and I wear it for performing like uh, I perform uh, I have a fiddling duo that with my son Métis fiddling duo so we perform there's lots of occasions I, I encourage you all to get yourself a granny a granny outfit and then you can wear it on all sorts of occasions such as today Anyway, that's enough of me talking. We have so much rich stuff to respond to or people want to, whatever you want to offer at this point. We have, what do we have? Like 45 minutes, I think. If, if we run out of gas, we don't have to go that long, but we can just open it up. Um, sorry, uh, um, could I ask a question now? Sure, yeah. Sure, I, I just typed a question. Um, on the chart asking what is confederacy and um, ah. if uh, the Canadian feder confederacy is the same as the confederacy in the south of the US and somebody told me it was when Canada became a nation in yes. 1867 yeah and the presentation I was under the impression that this recovery this rememory is about people who have been there before we could even begin dating in any calendar. And uh, only in 1867 that that space became a nation. I, I, need, I need some clarification there. Yeah, 1867 is when Canada became a country, just, just to put it, you know, before that it was part of Britain, right? It was a colony. And so 1867 is when Canada became a nation. And so what we're, we're talking about is um, what happened with Indigenous peoples in that process? What did nation building mean? What did uh, creating a nation mean uh, to us as Indigenous peoples? Many of whom don't consider themselves part of Canada, but they continue to consider themselves from the Indigenous nations that they're from. So yeah, in short, it's when Canada became a country. And what kind of and what kind of country are we building as we go forward and you know all this stuff. So the July 1st is actually the day we celebrate. It's our national independence day, if you call it. Um, we don't call it independence day, it's Canada Day. And then of course there's July 4th that just passed too. So does that answer your question? I'm sorry, I didn't see it in the chat because I was busy. Yeah, my, my my camera is not on. I'm sorry. I no, was just okay. kind of curious. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I was thinking that the uh, the people who have the indigenous people you were referring to represented by these grandmothers and and uh, present mothers are uh, they go way back in history beyond 1867. And they do. most they, they do, and most yeah. of the memory that is being recovered definitely is a memory that has uh, predated 18 whatever. So um, that somebody came around and drew some lines on a piece of paper and says it has become a country. Yeah, I have, I have issues with that, uh, but that's a conversation for another day. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened because actually our nations crossed the border between Canada and the States, right? Many of them. So um, this, this frontier that we have is an action, like as in all places where colonization happens, colonization. You have, you have groups of people and then people come in and they carve up into these settler nation States, right? So, so yeah, thank you for your question. You're welcome. Okay, new questions. Um, should I take the one in the chat and then I see somebody with their hand up. How do you teach the next generation if you have good ancestors and we mind the gap generation? I'm not quite sure I understand that, but if somebody else wants to take a stab at it. Uh, 
Uh, it might be helpful to um, just hear from the person who asked the question. Can you tell us a bit about um, what you mean by the gap generation? Okay, I am maybe. Yes. Uh, I see somebody who's raised their hand. That's the same. That's. Okay. There we go. Thank tell us who asked the question. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm Paulus from Indonesia. Uh, I appreciate from your sharing to us about uh, good assessors from uh, Kim's grandmothers we, to teach uh, generation to generation in Canada or maybe in specific contexts. My question is based on your explanation to us. Uh, how do we? How do you teach to next generation, especially maybe to your grandchild or maybe in your student that we have uh, that you have a uh, good ancestors and I think it is not easy because uh, in intergenerational studies we mind the gap generation so uh, when you tell to your next generation or maybe in your grandchild or your students about this uh, this is the gap generation is all can be brings preaching. I think something like that. Uh, because when we learn about uh, good ancestors, I think uh, we also learn about uh, gap generation. So good ancestors can be delivered good or well to next generation to understand about the good values that happened in the past. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you answered a lot of your own question. <laughs> But perhaps some of the religious educators want to put us, you know, at that angle on it. Or anybody have any feedback from the group? Yeah, thank you so much for your question. Um, if I understand it correctly, um, you're talking about how mentors um, might sound preachy when, you know, they're trying to work with young people as opposed to um, including them in decision-making processes and accompanying them and, um, and modeling, um, you know, a particular kind of um, basically embodying um, this, this idea of collaboration across generations. And I think that's, I mean, that's really what we need to start doing more of in religious education rather than um, producing um, you know, a, a static normalized understanding of what religious education is and, and then just imposing it on others. I mean, it really needs to be very collaborative. And um, I, I think that when you invite people to have a dialogue and you listen carefully and you're open to learning, uh, you know, across the board um, mutually, that's when change happens. And that's when, you know, they feel the, the gap begins to shrink. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, and I would just say storytelling is always good. <laughs> and I think an element of indigenous wisdom traditions that sometimes gets flattened when we come into multicultural discursive spaces is the uh, reverence for our elders that appears in many other communities and cultures as well. So there is, you know, yes, there is a, a generation gap and um, new generations are increasingly on this, right? This is their source of wisdom. Um, so, you know, for me as a mother, it becomes very important for, um, for us to go to Roberta's house and sit around her table with no um, uh, devices and for my son to learn how to engage with his elders um, uh, respectfully and in, um, in conversation about what matters. So to me, um, that's mm, 
it's a matter of, of practice, right? Again, it's a matter of practice. Um, the more we do it, the more our children learn to, um, and our young people learn to uh, engage with in respectful dialogue with the, with their elders. And I also think just um, uh, having our young people around us while we uh, participate in discourse and while we work and have conversation is important. The piece that I wrote in there about like listening to people talk ad nauseum about tribal politics and state politics, like that's a real thing that I've like, that my family trained me to do over generations. And I was swimming the other night with my husband and son and we were talking about, um, oh, it was on July 4th and we were talking about how unpatriotic we were feeling. And I asked my son later if he had, if he had son, fun swimming and his response was, Yes, but you and daddy, you know, talked uh, the whole time about religion and politics. But what's important about that is that he's, um, you know, he's in part of the explicit and implicit dialogue and he's learning from his elders while also being a kid. So, you know, I say sometimes I never rush my child out of the room when I'm working like I am today because I want him to hear the conversations that we're having, even if he doesn't understand them, understand them at this time, right? There's uh, implicit education happening here. And when we gather around kitchen tables with our aunties and grannies, that happens as well. And so, you know, I insist that the kid put the phone down and that we uh, engage in multi-generational conversation. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Okay. I don't see other hands up or questions. Are there any reflections around kitchen table practice from anybody thinking about how you take it forward or any of the other things that we were talking about? I think Kim, just kind of following up um, with what Anne shared is that this kitchen table practice happens anywhere and everywhere, right? It happens around the kitchen table. It happens, you know, in the pool when you're hanging out with your kids. It happens outside of the classroom. It happens while you're gardening with your mom or, I mean, that's, it, it happens anywhere. And I think that broadening this understanding of what theological education is and who our conversation partners are um, is part of this, this practice as well, right? That we, we are um, blurring the lines between, you know, what is, what we're doing at home, what communities we are working with, what um, institutions, you know, we, where we, where we use, you know, particular titles, um, and so it's, it's really like having these broad and deep conversations about how everything that we do is informed um, by the conversations that we're having and by the, 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 the practices that we are um, embodying and the commitments that we have. Thanks, Patricia. Okay, I see Cheryl has her hand up. Go ahead, Cheryl. Thanks, Kim. Um, thank you again today for, for this presentation. Um, so I'm reflecting on um, what, what we've been talking about over the last couple of days, and especially um, the kitchen table and the methodology as you've been speaking about it, and as well, Dr. Fears and Pastor Ombeni this morning, um, I attended their presentations um, about contextuality and resistance. And so I'm thinking in terms of uh, pluralistically, we, we all here represent many kitchen tables uh, from many ethnicities and many first peoples on many continents. And in you know, both of our countries, Canada here, 
uh, where I am and the United States, where many of you are, but some of you are in the Netherlands and some of you are in Australia um, and in other countries, and you have had First Peoples there too, who have been walking uh, the territories for millennia. And so I just wonder if in the future, we want to become more pluralistic and blur the boundaries between our countries. And if we want to share kitchen tables amongst our different ethnic, racial, linguistic lines, how might we do that? It's difficult when people become afraid of losing their tables. For example, our province of Quebec is very well, well uh, known in our media for insisting that um, they are a separate nation. I'm speaking very generally, uh, but there is a lot of fear in Quebec for losing the French language, uh, which you know I can understand, as well as many of the First Peoples in Canada, afraid that their generations to follow will lose their languages. When languages are lost, culture is lost, a lot is lost. So how do we, how do we practice this? And your question, Anne, was in terms of our, um, our association, our guild, um, and I'm even broadening, you know, the guild to, to worldwide, um, because I see myself as someone who've always been interested in many different cultures. Um, I was born in Jamaica. Um, my parents moved to Canada when I was three. Um, we had no family in Canada, um, but many of my, um, my people um, left at some time that I'm not familiar with, Africa, uh, Israel, and Cuba. So those are the three lands that I'm aware of. Um, but how do I connect with all tables? Sorry for taking so long. <laughs> and I, I think it kind of builds on your question yesterday, which was also around making connections. And it sounds like there's been a lot of talk about multicultural connections and who gets invited to into the table when do you open it up and so on and I, I guess there's no snappy answer for that right it sounds like it's been the um subject of a lot of dialogue here but i don't know if other people have anything um they want to say in response to that with i guess pertaining to this work that you're doing here in the guild and so on too in particular right I mean, I think I, I would say, at least from my own vantage point, that I'm the invitation is for me to be a both and person. And that it means in part that I'm always doing the work to cultivate knowledge and wisdom in my particular community as a source of resistance and sustaining. And I'm also um, uh, trying to make connections um, beyond my culture to utilize the gifts and resources from my tradition, not in ways that are appropriating, but in ways that can reach across um, uh, in order to learn from others. So, um, you know, I would say again, like kitchen table space is not, it's not an indigenous woman's thing. Like we don't own it. Um, African-American women write extensively about kitchen table spaces. Um, I've been gathered around a lot of Korean and Korean-American kitchen tables. Um, and you can see here, just even in our presentation, that we've gathered a diversity of Indigenous women scholars from a diversity of locations. So 
For me, that means kind of constantly working to build the knowledge from my ancestors and from my community and also um, um, beyond that. And to, and I think food is like super easy way to do that or, you know, having tea. Um, find those interlocutors, right? Food or tea as an interlocutor. Oh, my cat. Um, uh, you know, find those interlocutors to, to, to find places to make connection. And sometimes our food and our tea can help us get through the sticky points of our conversations, right? And, and help us stay there at the table. Sometimes our recipes, uh, our sharing of our practices can help kind of get us through those sticky places. I like that very much um, because it, it, it reminds me of this morning when Dr. Fears was talking about the reaction that people um, present, the fear um, when you present yourself, um, whether it's your um, pedagogy or whatever it is that they don't receive, you know, probably very unconscious um, and how do you how do you speak to that fear while you're resisting and at the same time invite collab collaboration well it's it, it's very very difficult and as one um, one person in our group I don't remember her name but she made a, an excellent point and said you know I've given up up trying to, I've given up uh, thinking that I should lower my voice in my class, short of like what you said, Anne, I, I didn't apologize to that, to that friend who we were talking to, who I said, I don't want to hear any man's comment today, right? Uh, yeah, so a lot of things, a lot of things, a lot of things to, to think about. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, I, I think Patrick has his hand up next. Yeah, thank you for this. This is just so incredible, just like last night. Thank you so much. I'm kind of picking up on that question, um, thinking about this idea of, I'll pick up on the recipes thing or Nepalese because uh, Patricia, you, you mentioned it and, and you brought me into my grandma's kitchen. So I feel like I can go there, but there's this kind of image that's kind of stirring for me around my grandmother making Nepalese or tortillas and this idea of the recipes that she would feed anyone that came through the door. Like the table is wide enough, there's enough food. But in this practice of the academy, we're an academic guild, the, the politics of extraction are real, like, you know, coming in to extract my grandmother's recipe for someone else's benefit that doesn't feed them. I am super curious how you all think about that in terms of this is an academic practice is this is a, the kitchen table and how to protect my grandma from folks who are trying to steal off her table, which she would say, what are you doing? <laughs> Give me the food. You can always come for food. I don't know why you're trying to take my recipe. Like I'll cook for you all day. So I'm, I'm just curious how you all are thinking about that. And those two things going together, like the this kind of expansive joy and love that is the kitchen table methodology about sitting there with folks that I think a lot of us can relate to. And then the kind of the, the how we make our living is a colonial practice of extraction, you know, and how do we how do we balance those two things? Uh, Lisa, I see you have a, your hand up for a response. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for that question, Patrick. <clears throat> I want to. I was thinking about the classroom and um, Annie Lockhart Gilroy and I, who she is present. Um, we had a class that we co-taught together, and Annie, feel free to jump in at any time if I misrepresent our course. Um, we actually taught Native American theory and theologies and womanist theory and theologies. We co-taught it. And we had over 20 people enroll during COVID times to attend our course. And so we had the multi-generational, we had the intercultural, um, we had the people who wanted 
on some level, whether they were conscious of it or not, some sort of appropriation of experience. And so we had to really, we met for our lectures because it was an online course. Um, we did it through Canvas and we would meet together and we would drink tea and we would have like this sort of podcast conversation around the readings. And we also had a section in the Canvas area where the students could ask us questions because we couldn't figure out a way to do everything synchronous when they actually signed up for an asynchronous course. Um, so that was our way of kind of pulling the students' voices in. And sometimes it was a voice we wanted and sometimes it was a question that would just eat at your soul, right? I mean, it was like cannibalism, right? Um, forget about eating the grandmother's recipes. It's like asking me to do some sort of ceremony or smudging when I'm wanting to talk about theory and theology. I mean, that is not what I'm about, right? And Anne was one of our guest speakers and we talked about the epistemology of dreams through indigenous lenses, through womanist lenses. Um, there are certain boundaries that you have to um, put up. And then we knew there was always going to be those questions that you kind of anticipate um, coming up. So we had to really kind of get together and get our game plan together for how we were going to address it in a respectful but uh, firm manner that honored our boundaries around those issues. Um, I tend not to have the same kind of filter that Annie does. So she was a great uh, sounding board for me. And I see her smirking and thinking boundaries, what boundaries? But she really does. She's much more diplomatic about things than I am. <laughs> um, so it's possible to have these spaces, but you're going to run into people who are going to have hurt feelings and you're going to have your feelings hurt. That is the human condition. Um, the kitchen table, there's not just one is another thing that I want to talk about as far as even you as an individual educator, right? You go to certain places and you're the student and you go to other places and you're the fount of wisdom, wisdom the auntie, the uncle, the grandfather, grandmother. Um, the, the thing that I go back to with the relationality part of it is <clears throat> There is a radical relationality that is, that is at the very heart of what it means to have an indigenous worldview, an indigenous cosmology. It, it is based in an anti-Platonic um, things that have body. Everything has meaning. Everything is sacred, right? even when it's hard to deal with, when it's hard to look at, you still need to, on some level, have some sort of reverence because that is part of you too. Um, and learning how to negotiate those spaces in ways that you do have boundaries, that you do have respect, it is, it is the human condition. And if you don't want to share your grandmother's recipes, don't share your grandmother's recipes, you know? And honestly, I get so frustrated with, with the idea that the white settler gaze is entitled to my experiences or entitled to someone else's experiences. We are not entitled to anything. Anything we receive is a gift, right? And we respect that gift for what it is. Um, and if we can't, then we need to, to be respectfully taught to learn that there are boundaries around what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. And, you know, you don't have to give your reason for why you don't share specific things. Um, it is a constant negotiation and 
the academic space is just one more space where we have to figure out how to care for ourselves, for those around us, for those narratives that we want to share, and for those that we, we necessarily keep for ourselves. Because just because they want it from you doesn't mean they're entitled to it. And I've said it before, I'm not going to put on the red face and dance for you. That is not what I am here to do. I'm here to be authentically myself, to listen to you, to give you information and help you process that through your own hermeneutical lens. Um, and that's, that's all I have to kind of say about that. So keep what's yours, Patrick. Don't just feed the masses because they want it. Well, I would, I would just add briefly that this also has to do with research ethics, right? And so there's been a movement over the last 20 some years is in particular, because I do re, re, uh, community-based research with indigenous peoples. And there's been uh, uh, this movement around, you know, like um, nothing about us without us, which is a community engaged scholarship thing, ownership, con OCAP, ownership control, access and possession. Uh, there's research ethics boards now in indigenous communities. So there has been a movement to say no more helicopter research, no more extractivism. Um, it absolutely has to serve the community. So those things are afoot. They started in health research. I don't know. I'm not for, as familiar with the scholarship that, um, that you folks and the disciplines that you folks work in, but, um, yeah, there are processes that could and should be followed. Um, and at least, at least in Canada, I see, um, you know, there's, that's still going on, but there's less opportunity to do that because of the processes that are happening through the research ethics boards. Um, and now we're moving into more piloting like particular indigenous research ethics processes. So extractivism, yeah, it can happen, but it can, you can really get slapped around if you, if you do that in certain places and spaces now, thankfully. Lisa put up a good um, Linda Tuhi Weissmith's book, which is a good one. There's lots of literature on indigenous research methodologies and all of it says, you know, no more, no more extractivist, voyeuristic kind of research, right? Okay, other, we got, Anne, were you gonna say something? I think we got about yeah, No, I think we're coming up on the transition period between this and the sessions that start at, okay eight eastern um so is does anyone have a final burning question or comment that you'd like to make before we break for the for the day comments well um i just want to share my um incredible intense gratitude for kim anderson and her willingness to cross the boundaries uh, between secular scholarship and religious scholarship <laughs> and blur the boundaries of relationship with us and for um, this community of women, Lisa, Patricia, Yenny, um, who have worked together uh, for the last couple months. Um, thank you to, to each of you for being here and um, being a part of this work today. And we're off to the next session.